Hello everybody. Uh, I hope everything's fine with everybody. Uh, today's November 14th, 2017. This is Donna Early. Uh, many of you all know that my life is kind of in the shambles right now. I've got a lot going on. Um, first and most important right now is my baby sister was diagnosed with melanoma cancer. It's very aggressive and she's in stage four. Um, I just set her up a Facebook page a few weeks ago along with the fundraiser to help raise money to pay for uh, medicines and treatments and tests that are not going to be covered under her Medicaid. Um, she's pretty seriously sick and I really could use help from everybody uh, to help her. Uh, she, her Facebook page is Lori's Battle. It's L O R I S Battle. And the fundraiser is on her page. And if you don't mind, please share. If you can donate, it, it would be appreciated. There's no amount too small. Um, it's not a very good looking outcome that she's facing. And I'd like to be able to help her fight it the best that we can. Um, the main objective that I have here today in doing this video, uh, many of you all know about JJ making the trip to Pennsylvania to get the ACL surgery he needed. Um, it didn't go as planned. Matter of fact, it didn't go well at all. And um, I wanted to let everybody know the story. However, because of the way things that happened, I ended up retaining an attorney. Um, to try to recover some of the damages um, and for that reason I couldn't just come out and tell everybody what what had went on um, this information information needs to be out because of what these people have done and to bring awareness so that nobody else falls victim to them um, for those of you who know JJ, y'all know that I've been trying to do everything I can um, to get uh, the surgery that I've to been told that he needs so much. Um, following in this video will be a brief summary of what transpired. Um, I'm going to try to make it as short as possible. Uh, I figured this would be an easier way uh, to let you guys know the facts, and when I say facts, I mean everything that I speak of in this video um, is true, and I do have um, the evidence to back that proof up. Um, the information uh, in the video will be the best of my knowledge, um, and if any of y'all have any questions about anything in particular, uh, of course, you can always message me, call me, whatever, uh, and I would be sh be more than happy to provide you with uh, proof of what I'm saying. Um, first of all, I want you guys to know that I love my dogs. I have four boxers, two chihuahuas, and a Jack Russell. Um, they're all I have. They're my immediate family. That's all that I have in my life every day. And I love them and I do anything in the world to keep them safe and healthy. Um, JJ just happened to be my emotional support dog. I didn't even realize it myself for a long time, but in talking to my mental health therapist, um, she confirmed that um, that's what he was. He was my emotional support. Um, I suffer with major depression and I suffer with post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, I've got some chronic anxiety uh, that flares up quite often. Um, and then imagine <laughs> I end up in animal rescue. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but you know, um, like I know, once you get off and you see what's going on, you can't turn around and walk away from it. Um, anyway, um, I'm going to try to start back when I first noticed JJ. 
uh, was March the 1st. Um, he come in the house and he had his hind leg retracted, his right hind leg. And I thought, oh, well, him and Jr. out there playing rough again. He twisted or stepped wrong. He'll be all right. So I continued to watch him throughout the day, and he wasn't getting any better. So the next day, which was March the 2nd, I loaded him up and took him over to our local vet over in Buckeye. Um, Buckeye Veterinarian Clinic, which is run by Dr. Helen Ryan. Uh, when I got him there, Dr. Ryan uh, wanted to do x-rays, but because of his size, he was like 90 pounds at the time, uh, and him being a uh, high-energy boxer, um, it was not going to be an easy thing to take x-rays, so she told me that we needed to sedate him, and I okayed that. So she sedated him and took the x-rays, and then when she came in to talk to me, she told me that a, uh, JJ had an ACL injury and that's a cruciate ligament in his back leg that he had injured and she said those types of injuries needed to be um, repaired surgically or as time goes on and you know he ages it would just make him more and more lame um, and she also said since she was a small clinic that she didn't perform those surgeries on dogs the size of JJ. So she referred me out to an orthopedic veterinarian. Um, it was Southwest Veterinarian Surgical Services. And I went on March the 8th. Uh, and it's over in Glendale. And I took JJ over there and he was seen by Dr. Seifert, Rachel Seifert. Uh, once we got there, they told me that they needed to take their own x-rays. Um, and again, JJ was going to have to be sedated. Uh, Dr. Seifert also expressed um, that she wanted to run a full blood panel on him to check for valley fever. Uh, valley fever is a disease out here in Arizona. And what it is, it's spores that lie up in the the ground in the in the sand out here and once the wind blows and it and and the sand blows around it puts those spores airborne and if they happen to be breathed in um, those spores can go to your brain it can go to your uh, joints uh, lungs um, and it can cripple you. It can. Uh, it can do a lot of things, and it's not only animals that can get it. People can also get valley fever. Well, valley fever is a very, very lengthy treatment. Uh, a lot of people are on antibiotics and medication for up to two years uh, to get rid of it. So it's a pretty horrible disease out here. And given the fact that I wasn't really for sure, I went ahead and Dr. Schaefer did a full blood panel. Well, it did come back that JJ did not have valley fever, but she said that he did have um, an ACL injury. Um, she said that they would do the surgery and that um, it would cost me $4,500. Uh, that did not include any post-op treatments or testing or anything done following the surgery. So it was a base of $4,500 to get his leg op operated on. So it's a pretty invasive surgery. The dogs are down for about eight weeks. Um, can you imagine a young, <laughs> overexcited boxer being down for eight weeks? It was going to be quite the chore for me to get him through this, but... You know, like I said, I love my dogs. I'd do anything in the world for them. The only problem is I'm on disability, and I had no way to get the $4,500. So that next day, I set JJ up a Facebook page, and I set up also a fundraiser. And I figured that going to some of my animal friends, who are always gracious with donations uh, to help animals in need, I figured that maybe we could raise the money. I also set up yard sales and auctions and 
all sorts of things to try to get this amount of money. Well, um, in the meantime, they had put JJ on an inflammation drug um, to kind of help with the pain. And he eventually started putting a little bit of weight down on that leg, but not much. And I could tell that he was still bothered by the way he would sit back on his hip or, you know, how slow it would take him getting up. And then uh, I could hear him from time to time. I have laminate flooring in the kitchen, and I could hear him from time to time with that back leg dragging, so he wasn't really picking it up. Uh, so I knew he had some kind of problem, and I've already at this point seen two Arizona veterinarians, and they both diagnosed him with an ACL uh, injury. Um, so set up the fundraiser, and of course it wasn't going very were <laughs> very fast. Uh, wasn't collecting much money. I think I had like four hundred and some odd dollars, and I had a little money stuck back from the yard sale and the auctions, and um, I knew it was going to be a long uh, road to hoe, and, but I needed to do it. I needed to get him fixed. Um, so we continued trying to collect money, and on April the 9th, it was on a Sunday, I got up and JJ was just listless. He wouldn't eat, he wouldn't drink, he wouldn't even go outside. He just wanted to curl up in a ball, and I knew something was very wrong with him. And I did get him to go outside, and he did potty, and the stool that I seen was something like I've never seen before. So I knew something was horribly bad. It looked like it had tissue in it, and I didn't know if something was going on with his stomach or what. So I rushed him into an emergency vet on Sunday and uh, that was North Buckeye Animal Hospital and I seen Dr. Kate Hamilton. Uh, they did a physical examination and I had also told her about the ACL and during her physical examination of JJ she said that he did have a lot of play in that joint and that it was more than likely an ACL injury that they too could do the surgery and their surgery would run about thirty eight hundred dollars and that's better than forty five but you know I'm still about thirty four hundred dollars away from it but she went ahead and um, checked him for what was causing him to be listless um, it wasn't connected to the injury at all and they did a parvo test and she come back to tell me that he was positive. I didn't really think that that's what it was, but you know, I'm not a vet. So they wanted $3,500 to keep JJ. And uh, of course I didn't have that. And I opted for the medications. Um, and I was going to bring him home and treat him myself. Not an easy task, mind you, but I, I really had no other options. So that vet visit cost me about $800. Uh, the first one with Dr. Ryan was about 300, and then when I took him to the ortho doctor, that too was 300. Hang on, we got a, we got a baby here that needs some loving. Um, JR, must you really? Get down. Get down. Mom's on video. Get down. Get down. You know I'm up to something. Um, so I've already pretty well exacerbated all the money that I made on any of my auctions and my yard sale and that sort of thing. So um, I took him home and um, thank goodness for Charlene Tipton and a couple other ladies that live around here locally. They would come over and help me to IV him, um, and there were times that they couldn't be here, and I would have to crawl inside JJ's kennel with him to IV him and sit there and empty out a complete IV bag to get him hydrated. It wasn't easy. Um, I spent lots of money on bleach and different disinfectants. I was disinfecting blankets and 
cages and bowls and toys and um, all sorts of things. Um, plus, I had six other dogs at home. JJ had Parvo, chances are they've been exposed. So I was at my wit's end. I, I thought I, were gonna, I was going to lose my dogs. Um, I didn't know what to do, devastated, but I couldn't quit. Um, I have physical disabilities, emotional disabilities, and this was very hard on me. But again, I love my dogs and I didn't quit. I kept after it. So that was on a Sunday, April the 9th. The fall, that Tuesday, uh, which was the um, 11th, I believe, um, JJ's brother JR came down with the same symptoms. Um, I thought, oh, no, here we go. And so I started, I went and got more supplies and was also starting to IV JR. And JR, I almost lost him. Um, JJ was pulling through, but JR, I did. I almost lost him. And actually, I think it's a miracle that he's even alive. But I had let JR outside, and he had passed a stool, and I went, and I scooped it up, and I looked, and it looked like it was just invaded with a parasite of some kind, little rice-looking things. It wasn't your typical tapeworm. Um, I've seen those before, but it was something I never noticed before. So I scooped it up, and I made a beeline over to um, Dr. Ryan's office. And I asked them to run a parasite test on it, which that was going to take a couple of days. And asked them while I was there if they would run a parvo test. Now, this was Tuesday after JJ was diagnosed positive on Sunday. The parvo test that Dr. Ryan ran was negative for parvo. So I had spent $800 for all these medications, and he was misdiagnosed. Um, I then called a veterinarian. I have a veterinarian, Dr. Jim, out here. Um, I think he's semi-retired, but he holds a lot of vaccination clinics, you know, with the rabies and the, uh, all the other regular vaccinations. And he comes out in the area. Well, he knows I'm disabled, and he knows I had the big dogs. So as a favor to me, he'll come by the house and, and vaccinate my dogs when they need it. And I called Dr. Jim, and I said, you know, this is what's going on with JJ and JR. Dr. Jim says they don't have parvo. And uh, he said, I believe probably what they have, Donna, is Giardia coccidia, which is a... Uh, internal parasite and so from my understanding they can get that from standing water uh, insects uh, that sort of thing and again it's infectious it's contagious and so he told me to get some warmer and an antibiotic to follow up you know in case of infection and here I go again I've spent with seven dogs, I've spent over $300 buying the worming medication and $100 for the antibiotics. So, still disinfecting everything um, and treating them for worms. Well, JJ started to turn around and he was getting better. And then JJ, like I said, I had a little bit harder time with him. But after a couple of days, he, he started coming around too. So thank God um, they, they were all right. They didn't have Barbo, but they were all right. And none of the other dogs come down with the symptoms, but I treated and disinfected them right along with everything else. Um, so anyway, I'd gotten them beyond that. Um, and it was back to focusing on the surgery that JJ needed. Um, I continued to try to raise money and the donations were coming in so slow. Um, I depended a lot upon prayer and um, 
I was sitting here one day and a, a lady that I met through a very good friend of mine, her name is Lorraine Horvath, runs Keto, uh, Keystone Bulldog Rescue up in Pennsylvania. I'd seen a post come across Facebook and it was from Lorraine and she had a picture of this tiny Old English Bulldog puppy that somebody had brought to her and it was a cleft palate pup and she was frantic. Lorraine's been in rescue, she said 22 years, but she's never cared for a cleft palate pup. And I had about a year before raised two boxer pups from day one uh, and they're a year and a half old now I'm doing very well. But I had to bottle feed them around the clock uh, until they were able to eat on their own because of the cleft palate. The cleft palate pups can be saved. Before, in the past, vets always uh, recommended euthanizing them. Uh, some of them don't make it because if they happen to aspirate or get food uh, you know, down in their cleft and it goes into their lungs, you're going to lose them. But a good portion of those cleft palate pups survive. And once they get up to where they can eat on their own, um, they do quite well. So Lorraine had this pup, and I contacted her. You could tell that she was, you know, concerned and scared. And I contacted her and talked to her, and I said, you can do this. You know, I just raised two pups. And I said, here's the formula. Here's how you need to altercate the nipple on the bottle so that they get the right flow. Uh, keep them warm. You have to rub their little bellies and stuff to help them. You have to take the role of mama. And I gave her my phone number and I told her I'm available around the clock. If you have a problem, we're going to get this little bulldog through it. And sure enough, we have. Uh, Cedric's, oh, he's probably close to a year old now. I seen a picture of him the other day. He's doing quite well. Uh, he's not the little bulldog anymore, but, um, and I know Lorraine appreciated that. Uh, she told me many, many times that, you know, I, I helped her so much through raising Cedric. So, on April the 17th, uh, Lorraine contacted me through Facebook on a private chat. Now, Lorraine runs Keystone Bulldog Rescue in Lingonier, Pennsylvania, uh, where she um, rescues uh, English Bulldogs, French Bulldogs, that sort of thing, some of the more expensive breeds. And she gets them vetted, and she gets them adopted out. Uh, so Lorraine got to talking to me about JJ, asking me about JJ. You know, why, why aren't you getting more money? What's... You know, what doctors, what have they said, and how much are they charging? And I told her, and um, she could not believe that they wanted $4,500. So, Lorraine, at that point, I, you know, and I told her that I'd taken J.D. to three veterinarians here in Arizona, and they all three had diagnosed him with an ACL injury. Lorraine says, well, I have... Um, a um, veterinarian up here in Pennsylvania. He's the one that takes care of all my rescue dogs. He has a state-of-the-art facility. His children are also veterinarians and Dr. Takix does ACL surgeries every day. And she said he ain't gonna charge you no $4,500. She said he will probably charge you 600 for the surgery. And let's say that he needs a couple of things following post-surgery. She said maybe another 200 She said you can get JJ surgery for $800 if you bring him, or if we get him up here to my vet. Wow. So $800, I'm cl fairly close to that on the fundraiser now. Um... It's a hell of a lot cheaper than 4500 or 3800 and but I told Lorraine, that's wonderful, but I have no way of getting in there. I physically, emotionally, and financially cannot make that trip. It was a 2200 mile trip one way. 
I said my car would not make it. Uh, so there's no way that I can get him to Pennsylvania. She said, Donna, don't worry about that. She said, I had been doing this for 22 years. She said, I have used Paws and Pilots and other transport companies. She said, I will coordinate volunteer transport to pick JJ up and bring him to Pennsylvania. That way Dr. Takix can do his surgery. I've got a lady by the name of Laurel Cook who will temp foster him while he's recovering from the surgery. And once Dr. Takix releases him, then I can get him brought back to you through volunteer transport. Wow, I was kind of taken aback. I mean, she was willing to do a lot for me. And I contemplated it on a while. Lorraine says, Donna, send me your medical records from the Arizona vets, and I will take them to Dr. Takix and have him review them. So I did. I sent them to her, and on the 19th, Lorraine confirmed that she got the medical records, the x-rays, the physical notes, everything on JJ from all three vets here in Arizona and that she was going to take them to Dr. Takix. Well, Dr. Takix was out on vacation and was supposed to return around the first part of May. And um, Lorraine was going to take them to him to review the records. And so on May the 6th, uh, Dr. Takix took JJ's records and reviewed them from all three Arizona vets. And then he scheduled JJ for surgery on June the 8th. Now, to me, that indicated that Dr. Takix agreed with the other vets here in Arizona and that JJ did have an ACL surgery. Now, I was told that Dr. Tak Takix was a reputable, reputable vet and he specialized in the ACL surgeries. Um, folks, this was the only way I was going to get JJ surgery. I wasn't getting nowhere near the 4,500 they wanted to do it here in Arizona. And I wanted my dog to have the surgery so that he could get better. This was the only possible way. So I opted to do that, and I just felt like my prayers had been answered. Um, so Lorraine knowing that I couldn't financially, emotionally, um, physically make the trip, she started coordinating volunteer transport. She was going to use pilots and paws, however a few of the pilots were unavailable, so she got with Frankie Browning of uh, Pitbull Pit Stop Transport out of Jacksonville. And the two of them worked together and coordinated both a land and air transport for JJ to make it from Arizona to Pennsylvania. Um, again, his surgery, surgery was scheduled for June the 8th. Um, and so the ladies had plenty of time to get that coordinated. Um, I still, I could not believe that this was happening and that JJ was going to be able to get his surgery. Well, Lorraine told me there were a few things that I had to take care of before JJ could be transported and one was to make sure all his vaccinations were updated, which they were, and that JJ had to have a health certificate in order to travel uh, from state to state. Uh, so I called my traveling vet, the one that comes out and vaccinates my dogs here at my house, Dr. Jim and I told him that I needed a health certificate. So he came out, examined JJ, and he filled out, a, I think it's a Form 52, um, which is the health certificate that he needed. I packed JJ up a folder. It had the health certificate, it had vaccination records, it had microchip information, it had his county tag information. It had any medical uh, needs that he had. I sent dog food, bottled water, bowls, um, toys, chew um, the bully sticks, um, 
leashes, collars, seat belt, you know, to secure them in, in the car, uh, blankets. Um, he had a care package that I sent with him. Plus, uh, Lorraine and Frankie set up a private chat on Facebook to where um, all the, the transporters, volunteer transporters could communicate to make sure they were meeting in the right place and they were running on time. And of course, I was in the chat as well. That way I could monitor and I could see where JJ was. And they posted pictures. That helped me a lot because I can look at JJ and tell what he's, te you know, what he's feeling. And he looked pretty tired. He was a little puzzled at first, but I think he actually liked riding in the cars. He never rode in cars too many times, but um, all the volunteer transporters that dealt with him fell in love with him, and uh, they said he did such a wonderful job. So I was real proud of him, but the chat, I sat here all day too in front of the computer, and the chat gave me an opportunity to keep an eye on my dog and make sure that he was okay. Well, I was watching the chat and JJ had made it to Kansas City and the lady who was going to transport him was going to have to actually keep him overnight you know to run with the route and her name was Tanya and when JJ got to Kansas City that chat stopped there was no information there was no contact there were no pictures and it made me a little bit leery, you know. Um, I went on there and I'd ask questions and I was being ignored. Nobody was answering me, so forth and so on. And I was sitting here at the house and I got a phone call. Well, it was from Dr. Jen, my traveling vet, the one that filled out the health certificate for JJ. He never calls me here at the house. Um, but mind you, all JJ's paperwork had Dr. Jim's phone number all over it. And Dr. Jim asked me, he says, what are you doing, Donna? And I said, well, nothing. He said, well, drop whatever you're doing and sit down. And when he said that, I started trembling from the inside. I felt something very bad had happened. And especially since I wasn't hearing any information on that chat, and Dr. Jim said, uh, J.J.'s been detained in New Mexico. And I said, what? He said, yes, J.J.'s been detained in New Mexico. Well, how can that be? Because I told Dr. Jim, I said, he's, last I heard, he was in Kansas City. He said, well, I got a phone call and J.J.'s detained in New Mexico. He said, didn't you... Didn't you send that health certificate along with him? And I said, yes, Dr. Jim, all his paperwork is with him. And Dr. Jim said, well, I, I got a phone call. And I said, well, I don't think it's JJ. I think he's in Kansas City. And we ended the call, and I called. I tried to get on the chat and ask questions again. Nobody is answering, so I finally contacted Lorraine. And I said, please confirm to me where JJ's at. And why is nobody responding on the chat? She said, JJ's in Kansas City with Tanya. And I said, okay. Well, my vet just said he was detained in New Mexico. What? She said. I said, yeah. I said, I'm a little bit concerned. You tell Tanya I want to see pictures, and I want to know how JJ's doing. Well, still nothing went on, you know. Um, Lorraine's in Pennsylvania, so how does she know JJ's okay in Kansas City? Anyway, so I was a little bit aggravated, and I got on the chat, and I said, I want to know where my dog is right now. Well, undoubtedly, that made Tanya, the lady that had JJ, uh, upset because I questioned her abilities. Um, when in fact she had ignored me time and time again and it also upset or maybe it even embarrassed Lorraine I don't know but Lorraine came to me and she said okay Donna from this point forward you communicate with me don't communicate on that chat you communicate with me well that kind of upset me as well because I have every right to know who has my dog and 
where he's at and how he's doing. Now, I didn't pay anybody, but it was all volunteer. And I still have the right to know where my dog's at and how he's doing. So anyway, I quit at that point. Um, then Lorraine called me and said, well, one of the pilots fell through to pick up in Kansas City and JJ's going to have to spend another night with Tanya. And she said, but Tanya has an anniversary and they got things they got to do. So we're going to take JJ to a local pet resort. And at that point, I said, oh, no, mm -mm. too many things are falling through the cracks. I've heard too many horror stories about pet resorts. I do not want my dog taking anywhere. So Lorraine got back with Tanya, and Tanya agreed that she would keep him. And I guess the pilot was going to meet them the next day to take JJ from Kansas City to Ohio. Well, it came up in the conversation that Tanya obviously was friends with this pilot named Jamie. Jamie had a female boxer and was wanting a male boxer. So then it kind of started adding up a little bit. And, and of course, this isn't fact. I can't prove this. But it was seemingly understandable why all of a sudden Tanya wasn't communicating with me if her friend indeed wanted a male boxer and they had commented on how beautiful boxer JJ was uh, and Jamie wanted to adopt JJ well the only problem there was JJ was not up for adoption he's my emotional support dog and a friend or I thought a friend was helping me out to get him to get his surgery. So I raised Kane a little bit and um, JJ was picked up by Jamie and he was flown into Ohio and he actually reached um, um, Pennsylvania uh, the day before his surgery. So on June the 7th JJ was transported over to Laurel Cook who was a temp foster she lived about five miles from the veterinarian clinic and she took him in the next day to have his surgery. Well, I was sitting here the morning of the 8th and I was just tied in knots. First of all, I'm without my emotional support animal. He's 2,200 miles away from me. He's probably scared. He's getting ready to go through this invasive surgery. He don't know where his mom's at and it was killing me to the bone. And I sat here, I cried, and I sat here and watched and waited and waited for a phone call to let me know how he was doing. Well, finally the phone rang and it was Lorraine, and I said, hey, how's JJ? Is his surgery over? Um, no, uh, his surgery's been canceled. I said, what? She said, yeah, Dr. Takix did a physical on him and there's nothing wrong with him. And I said, Lorraine, I know better than that. You know, I would not have sent my dog 2,200 miles for a surgery that he did not need. I said, I've got three vets here in Arizona that all diagnosed him with the ACL injury. I said, not only that, a month before he was transported, Dr. Takix received all medical records from all three Arizona vets to review. He reviewed them and he scheduled JJ for surgery. So that told me that Dr. Takix also agreed with those saying that, that JJ had an ACL surgery. Well, in the same breath, I was almost thankful that maybe he didn't need that surgery but I knew something was wrong with him. And I told Lorraine, I said, you have Dr. Takix do another set of x-rays. Well, she did, and she called back and she said, there's nothing wrong with him. And I said, Lorraine, I know better. She said, well, it could be that maybe one of his legs has, you know, developed a little bit longer than the other one, or 
you know, and it could even be the prescription for the inflammation that your doctor there in Arizona had him on. It was neither of those. I sat here and watched JJ from March 1st to June the 3rd, and I knew he had a problem. She said, well, the, the surgery's been canceled, um, and you're going to have to find a way to get JJ home. I can't tell you what that did to me. I fell, my anxiety soared through the roof. I had no money. I had no way of getting to Pennsylvania. My car would not make it. I had no other alternative. I searched for other ways to get him home. I called different transport companies and they wanted you know, uh, phenomenal amounts of money. Um, and it just so happens a friend of mine called and he wanted to know how JJ's surgery went. Well, by the time I talked to him on the phone, I was a complete wreck. I was crying. I was hysterical um, because Lorraine and them had gotten my JJ up there and he was going to be abandoned because I had no way to go get him. Dave understood. He knew I was a mess, and he was even worried for me because I wasn't in a very good frame of mind. I mean, after all, I'd put my dog at risk and put him in danger. Dave said, and this was on Thursday, the day J.J. was supposed to have his, have his surgery, and Dave said, well, I'm going, he said, I'm going to the bank in the morning, and he said, I'm going to put $3,000 in your account. I want you to get your airplane ticket. I want you to get up there, get JJ, get you a car, come back. Well, I know sometimes God sends us angels. Well, he sent me an angel that day. And so Friday morning I got up, I checked my bank account. $3,000 had been deposited by Dave. I got online, I booked me a flight, and that night at 8 o'clock I left Phoenix, Arizona headed for New York. Now, nobody that was involved with the rain or the transport had any idea that I was on my way up there because the only thing they knew is I was not financially, physically, or emotionally able to make that trip. But they had my dog and I would die for JJ. So, thanks to Dave, I got it into New York um, that Saturday morning uh, at 6 o'clock. I flew into Pittsburgh, and I was there at 10 that morning, Saturday morning. I had a rental car waiting on me. Um, I jumped in the car, and I drove, it was either two or three hours, to Nanty Glow, Pennsylvania, where is where Laurel Cook, the temp foster, lived that was to have seen JJ through a surgery. I had her address and I put it through the GPS system and I headed out to where JJ was at. And I called her and I said, listen, you know, I'll be there probably around noon to pick JJ up. And I had a little trouble finding her house, and, and I will uh, videotape some a second portion of this uh, to show you some of the where she lived. Uh, there were homes around her, but she lived in a one little section that was opened up, and everything around her was nothing but mountains and thick wilderness. Um, so I had a little trouble finding her house, and. Um, I was wore out. I had no sleep. I slept on the flight from New York to Pittsburgh, and um, I was just running on adrenaline and caffeine. Uh, now, mind you, I was going to be driving and everything else, so I could not take my mental health meds. I could not take my pain meds. There were a lot of medications that I could not take because they make me drowsy that I have to take on an everyday basis, but I could not take them and safely get into a car and drive. So I'm without my medication. I'm running on very little sleep. 
I'm stressed to the max, worried to death. And as I found Laurel's house, when I pulled up in the driveway, I seen JJ just running loose. He wasn't contained in a fence. He was not leashed or tied out. My dog had free roam of this area. Well, we all know what happens to loose dogs, don't we? Well, one, if J.J. would have gotten into that wilderness area, he may have never found his way back. J.J. has never been outside of a fence, and if he has, he's been leashed. Not one leash, but usually two. So here's my dog running loose in this area, and being a boxer, he would run up to somebody, bark, or act goofy and that person wouldn't know how to perceive his approach and we all neighbor we all know neighbors shoot dogs we all know that if somebody said oh there's a loose aggressive dog out here and a cop came by we all know that cops shoot dogs um he could have been attacked by a wild animal laurel had um the screen door to her mobile home she had the bottom of it knocked out and she let her dogs have free run well, I did not appreciate that. I mean, I have nothing against Laurel Cook. She's a nice lady. But my dog was in danger. And any rescue or any transport company, it should be a rule, uh, it should be mandatory that any dog, whether he belongs to someone or whether he's a shelter or a rescue, needs to be contained. There's laws against dogs running loose. Um, so anyway, I was a little upset about that, and I spent some time with Laurel, you know, talking, asking questions, because I wanted to know a little bit more of why things happen the way they happen. And, um, after talking to her, I realized that Lorraine was, and like I said, she had the bulldog rescue, so she dealt with a lot of old English bulldogs, and... French Bulldogs and that sort of thing and I guess she takes them and gets them neutered and bedded or whatever and then adopts them out for an adoption fee. Um, to me, Lorraine Horvath seemed to be a, what I would call a profiteer and I think she makes money on adopting out these dogs. Well, because one other thing is Laurel, who is Lorraine's friend, always seems to get the ones that are lame. Uh, for instance, there was one little bulldog, uh, I think the name was Macy, that when she come in, the baby was dragging her whole back end, couldn't walk. Well, Lorraine couldn't adopt that dog out like that, so what does she do? She gives the dog to Laurel. Laurel takes the dog to the vet and has treatments done, and little Macy gets where she can get up and move around a little bit on her legs, and then she dies two or three months later. Um, so, to me, it seemed like Laurel might be a dump ground for the dogs that Lorraine can't quickly adopt out. I don't know. Um, that's my feeling from talking to Laurel. Anyway, I talked to her for a little bit and me and JJ uh, got in the car and we headed home. Um, I was um, we're out. I think I ended up driving 200 or so miles to um, Hebron, Ohio when I just physically could not make another mile. And I pulled over and I got me and JJ a hotel room. Uh, so uh, for the moment now I'm going to close this video and take me a little break and when I come back I'll tell you about our trip home from Pennsylvania and the hardships that we faced. It didn't stop. It didn't stop. So I'm going to shut this video down and I'll be back with part two.